Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the museum. It's great to see so many of you here today uh, for a midday event. My name is John Holler. I'm the CEO. And on behalf of everyone associated with the museum, the trustees, our staff, our uh, volunteers, it's a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you here today for this session on Ken Siegel's new book. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. You do have question and answer cards in front of you, and we will be collecting those and using those to uh, help guide the discussion today. So please, as questions occur to you, feel free to use those cards. We'll be coming through the room to collect those uh, once the program gets started. KQED Radio is in today to uh, tape this session. We're delighted to have KQED FM airing so many of the museum events on public radio for Northern California. And please check KQED's listings to find out when the program is going to be airing. Normally, it's in an evening primetime slot around 8 p.m. And so if you would like to hear it again or if some friends uh, would like to have come today but couldn't, please let them know that we are going to be on the radio. And now today's program. Simplicity is the subject of the day, and in fact, it is the relentless pursuit by Steve Jobs to make products simpler and more elegant, those wonderful products that uh, we all use every day and that really have changed the world. And simplicity is the subject of Ken Siegel's new book, Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple Success. Steve Jobs once said, simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple, but it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. Ken Siegel is well positioned to understand Steve Jobs' obsession with simplicity and simple products. He worked with Steve for 12 years. He served as his ad agency creative director both when Steve was at Next and then when he returned to Apple. Ken and his team were responsible for naming the iMac and they were also responsible for Apple's legendary Think Different campaign, which was an integral part of Apple's transformation once Steve returned. Uh, Ken has also led the creative efforts for a number of other technology companies, including Dell and IBM, and he works with the top executives of those companies. His opinion is one of the most sought after in the business, and we're delighted to have him with us today. Moderating today's event is Harry McCracken, who is the editor-at-large, for Time, he covers personal technology for the magazine and for Time.com. You may know him here in Silicon Valley as the founder and editor of Technologizer, which is, uh, was an award-winning and much-read blog that was uh, made a part of Time, and of course Harry went with that. He founded it in 2008. He previously wrote for PC World and for Slate, Family Circle, Mac World, Discover, USA Today. He is one of the most followed and influential technology journalists in the Silicon Valley, and we're very delighted to have Harry with us today to lead this event. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Harry McCracken and Ken Siegel. So welcome everybody and welcome Ken. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've spent a meaningful mm. percentage of my life over the last decade reading books that try to explain how Apple does it. And most of them are not very good. And all of the, the other ones are by people who weren't actually there. Insanely Simple is the real deal, it's, and it's just a joy to read, and even though it's, it's very far from the first book on this topic, it is the best one. And um, one of the things I'm struck by is Steve Jobs is the main character in this book, but most of the other characters aren't people, they're concepts. You, you write about simplicity as if it was a human. You write about its arch enemy complexity. You write about the simple stick, which is sort of the stick that S Steve would use to bash complexity. And uh, it really feels like an epic battle, which, which Apple, for the most part, has won. And most large companies have a great deal of trouble winning the war against complexity. So I wanted to start just simply by asking you, how, you know, how does Apple do that? Mm. And why does, can it do it when almost nobody else can? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, I've never been to the, the uh, museum before. It's a new experience for me. It looks very cool. And I uh, had no idea this many people would show up. So um, thanks. Um, as for how Apple is able to do this and other companies don't, I, I think it's really just a, well, for starters, Steve Jobs. Um, it's his extreme focus, his relentless, uh, uh, the relentless pursuit of simplicity, shall we say, to borrow Lexus's old line, um, <clears throat> to bastardize their old line, I should say. Um, Steve was one of those guys who just didn't compromise on things, and you would, in many other places in your life, you. You do things, and uh, 
Along the way, people make suggestions like, well, we can get by with this or that, and that just didn't happen at Apple. You would learn very, very quickly when you were working with Steve that you had to go all the way 100% and then some. He would always push it back in your face, and it's got to be absolutely perfect. So I think other companies start out. Uh, I, I think all the companies I've worked with believe that simplicity is a superior way to go, um, and they set out in that direction, but things happen, and then people say, well, all right, we'll just go with that, and by the time you get to the end product, it's not at all simple anymore, and people get frustrated, um, and bad things happen, whereas at Apple, things stayed pretty darn pure uh, from start to finish. So, um, yeah, I mean, the thing that is sort of mystifying is, is nobody is in favor of complexity. I think most of the things Apple does are, are utterly logical when you look at them. Um, it's not confusing as to why um, simplicity has worked so well for them. And um, we talk a, a lot about the fact that Steve wanted Apple, despite how large it became, to act like a small company. Yes. It seems like most of the other large technology companies you worked for were definitely large technology companies. Can you talk a little bit about, about how Apple yeah. maintained that? I think there's a quote from uh, some interview that Steve did where he said that Apple acts like a startup, that in fact Apple is the world's largest startup. And I think that was a theme that I observed throughout all the time I worked with him, even as Apple got bigger, that uh, he wouldn't allow Apple to, to lose that thing that, is, that a startup has, that enthusiasm, the way people work together, he wouldn't let committees form that would dilute the work. Um, and I think he took great pride in creating the world's largest startup. That I think that's really what sets Apple apart, even though they're obviously a big company and they've got a sprawling organization and they, and they do certain things in very big company ways. They have to, manufacturing and financial and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the creating of products and the messaging that the, custo that the company sends out to the world, they keep that stuff very, very small. And it, it really probably isn't a whole lot different. This is a gross exaggeration about to come, forgive me in advance, but it's probably not a whole lot different than it was, different than it was when he was starting the company in his garage. I think Steve's small company frame of mind was something he held on to and did not want to uh, let get corrupted. And if he ever witnessed behavior that was indicative of a big company behavior, that's when you would get swatted down rather quickly. I was swatted once or twice myself. Well, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with, with Steve mm -hmm. and the company. You, you were not, never an Apple employee. True. You were part of the agency, but yet you were an insider. And talk a little bit about that and the other folks involved. Correct. Steve, uh, I think marketing, as we know, was a big, big part of everything that Steve did. Um, new products were uh, created you know, Steve could see how they would be marketed before they were even finished, obviously, or before they set out to build the products. He wanted to build things that, that had a place in people's lives, and he could see how that was going to be marketed. Um, I'm about to totally lose the question. We're at... Um, Just kind of talking about the agency and, and the, the right. relationship with Apple. So the marketing team for Steve, I promise it will be uh, the first of many lapses that I experience here, um, Marketing was very, very near and dear to Steve's heart, and I think he, that's why he chose his agency so carefully. Uh, he chose the agency for Next because he loved the advertising at that time that BMW and UPS were doing. A um, little story behind that one was that he, sent a, he, wa he was ready, the product had been built, uh, he was ready to advertise the Next computer, and uh, he wanted an agency and said, well, I like... UPS and BMW's advertising, so why don't you guys go out and find the agencies? We'll start by talking to those agencies, and it turned out that a single agency had done both of those things. So that's who he we went with, and obviously his relationship with Shia Day is a long-standing one um, and a very, very close one, and, and I think Steve always considered the agency uh, another arm of, of the company, so we did not feel like outsiders. We were privy to all the secrets and uh, and responsible for maintaining confidentiality and, and doing all things that an employee would have to do, but we just weren't employed by Steve, which was actually better because we didn't have to see him quite as much. And he, uh, <laughs> it was more like a grandfather relationship, and I think that was healthier. 
knowing, knowing what I know now, yeah. Uh, one of the things I love in the book is you talk about the, the rotating turret effect, which happened a lot in meetings you had. Can you talk yes. about that and, uh, and what it was like to be in, in these meetings with Steve Jobs? Yeah, well, there's this thing, and this, was, this isn't something, uh, well, I did see it happen. A, a direct report to Steve told me this story, and he prefers to remain anonymous. He may even be here today. I could embarrass him thoroughly by revealing his identity. But he told me, the way he put it, there was this thing called the rotating turret. And if you're in a meeting with Steve, and we were with, there with like five or six people, um, somebody might say something that was particularly dumb, which you didn't want to do in front of Steve. And he said, everybody else in the room would sort of recognize that, that someone had misspoken, shouldn't have said that thing. And it was as if the whole room went into slow motion at that point. And everyone in the room knew it was coming, but they were helpless to stop it. And you'd see Steve sort of like this, this rotating turret focusing on that person. Um, and then you'd, there would be that moment where the ammunition would be loaded. And then, <laughs> you know. Sorry, I didn't mean to single you out. Um, you're not hurt, are you? Uh, anyway, so that's an interesting point, though, I think, because... Um, and I think this is we, something we experience in the world of advertising as well. I've worked for agencies that are really, like, nice places to work. And I'm sorry to say that the work maybe is too nice, that you need a little pressure. You need to know that if you don't succeed, um, you may pay for it with your job. What have you done lately? That kind of thing. And I think that um, there was this thing going with Steve. It's like, you know, you want to please your father because when dad is happy, you will be happy and he'll gush enthusiasm and you'll feel really good about it. But at the same time, you would know that when dad is mad, you're going to get a whooping, you know? So um, when you worked with Steve, you knew that there would be consequences if you failed, which you would rather not experience. Um, and that would sort of give you a little extra push, but you wanted to please him um, and you wanted to do great things. And he was the, the leader who would push in, in those directions. So um, did, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but yeah, I, mean, I, I did. I'm, I'm glad I was never in his crosshairs, yeah. but in the book at least it comes off as a, as a useful management technique and ultimately yeah. a good one. You, you were never confused right. about where you stood. Um, exactly. You there, know, are, there are countless stories about him shutting down something. If he didn't like it, right. he would call you after the meeting and said, never bring right. that person back again. Exactly. Well, actually, I was going to go back one step there because I did not talk about this in my book, and I hate to just repeat myself. So here's a brand new one for you if you haven't read the book, or if you had read the book. Um, but it was one of those times. I, I said in the book that I had been the victim twice of an extreme Steve blow up. And uh, one of them was really just an interesting story because it, uh, it tells you what a perfectionist Steve, Steve was. It was when the first iMac insert was being prepared. And this uh, was just, it, it was like the first iPhone moment or the first iPad moment. Steve would be incredibly fixated on making that thing great and every detail had to be perfect. So we had done like one of those inserts we used to run in Time and Newsweek and um, like 12 or 16 pages worth of stuff. And um, you know, it's like, where were you when Kennedy was shot kind of a thing. I'll always remember every little detail about this phone call I received from Steve. Because I was sitting at my desk in the old binocular building down in LA where Shia Day was housed at the time. And I got this call from him. We had sent him the final version of the thing that was being printed. It was going to Time Magazine or whatever. And he called me from his car phone. Uh, so I could hear all the car noises. Uh, all the background noises from the car, and he was just livid. He, he had seen a photo, one of the shots of the keyboard in that thing was the wrong color blue. And when I tell you this, the wrong color blue, it wasn't really the wrong color blue. You or I would, be, would never see the difference between <laughs> that blue and the one that was actually on the keyboard. But Apple was making these little changes to the product up to the last minute, and the blue wasn't the exact blue that, and Steve saw it in the picture. So he screamed. I have never heard a human being scream as loud as he did. I wasn't in the room, but you could tell from, it, and it was like, I, I can't even use the words because this is such a, this is a family audience. I don't want to disturb anyone. Uh, but he was just livid that we would, he actually said, I'm, I'm sorry, just remembering, the exact line was, you've taken all the joy of this moment away from me. <laughs> he, 
And he didn't speak it so quietly, but it was like, you know, I had ruined his good time. Um, and he thought that the whole launch was going to be screwed up because this damn blue color wasn't the right color, which is obviously not true, but it meant that much to him. And, you know, you can look back and say, oh, that funny Steve, you know. <laughs> but at the time, it was somewhat terrifying. So I was sitting there at my computer writing every expletive down so I could share it with the team when we were done with the call. But it was, it was kind of scary. And I still have my transcript, too. It's one of my fond memories. <laughs> Put that in the next book. Well, let's talk about some, some of the campaigns. You worked on Think Different, which is probably one of several candidates for the most famous Apple campaign of all time. And even before the iMac came out, it, it played a key role in putting Apple back on the map. Talk a little bit about how you came up with that. Well, first of all, I, I'm always uh, want to be clear. I, did, you know, I hate to take credit for things I didn't do. The I was part of the you. team, correct. Um, but that was uh, part of the, before the agency was even appointed when Steve came back, when we were just having meetings, he was briefing us on what the issues were and what he wanted us to do. Um, and there weren't going to be any products for six months. We were just starting. This was uh, in November, I believe, of uh, 97. And iMac wasn't going to come out until spring, summer kind of time. So there was quite a bit of time when there was like nothing, really. There were going to be a few tweaks to the existing line, faster processors, that kind of thing. But basically, what are we going to do to, to restore confidence here? The, you know, the building is on fire, and we could go under if we don't reignite the uh, excitement about this company. So really, we had to reach the people who used to know a successful Apple, but had been disappointed to see that the company had been so mediocre in the years leading, uh, you know, about the 11 years that Steve was gone. Um, we had to reach people who were young enough that they never knew a successful a Apple. They needed to get to know what the company stood for. Um, and then the employees was probably the most important audience because they were primed and ready to, to return to greatness, but they needed to be reassured that Apple stood for something. So uh, the campaign was born of, of that, and the stroke of genius, I think, was um, actually came from a guy named... Craig Tanamoto, who, um, art director who came up with the words Think Different. And where I come from, art directors aren't supposed to come up with words, and all the copywriters were very upset by that. But um, I mean, I would love to have come up with those words. Uh, but they are, uh, they always got to me because I could see the words Think Different being literally hanging in the garage where Steve and Steve Wozniak created the first computer. It, it's what the company had always stood for. It really captured the essence of everything they believed. So you could say, you could put any product up in the history of Apple and, and say, think different, and it would work. And especially when the iMac came, which was another really major point. We hadn't seen the iMac at that point. So we were doing think different based on Steve's word. Great things are coming. I've been working with the engineers and designers, and things are going to happen. You've got to trust me. So we're going to you know, run this think different campaign. And as it turns out, once the iMac was unveiled and we all got past the first initial shock of it, you could, you could literally see think different under a picture of the iMac, and it would be perfect because no computer had ever looked like that before. You tell a great story in the book about a phone call Steve made to a friend of his in the White House. Oh, that guy. Yeah, this is one, you know, the book's been out for a couple of months now. And I'm, to be honest, I've been surprised. I, I thought this was going to be the most talked about thing because it was so shocking to me. But um, it was during the Think Different campaign. In those days, at the beginning, it was hard to talk a lot of uh, people and, their, and or their estates into appearing in the campaign because they didn't know, you know, what is this? We don't want to be in an ad campaign. Uh, uh, there, there are quite a few people who, who, whose images were never used for advertising, and, and we don't want to you know, denigrate the image of, of this, the, you know, the family of the um, celebrity or whatever. So, but once the campaign started running, uh, people started coming to us and wanting to be in it. And we would have these meetings quite often where it's time to refresh the campaign. Who are we going to go with? And um, there was one point, I remember, where Robert Redford had sent a request in through his people saying, I'd love to be 
one of your Think Different heroes. That would be fantastic. I've got Sundance and all the stuff going for me. And we'd sit in the room. This is like this total, you know, abuse of power kind of thing. But we'd sit there and go, hmm, Robert Redford, hmm, you know. You're, not, you're no Mahatma Gandhi, you know. So actually, so Robert Redford was spurned, I'm sorry to say. And uh, another one that was spurned, although he didn't contact us, but he was, his name was on the table, just interesting story perhaps, but Woody Allen. And it happened not so long after uh, his bad news, his bad behavior. Um, and everyone around the room thought he deserved to be in the campaign. He's certainly, it's like Pete Rose deserving to be in the Hall of Fame, you know. <laughs> but he's been a bad boy. Um, so we thought long and hard about that, and Steve said, to his credit, I don't want, you know, I, I know his artistic achievements are certainly at least as worthy as anybody in the campaign, but, um, you know, I, I don't like the person, and I think we have an obligation to, to, you know, have some kind of moral code here. Um, and that's, you know, the same way he's handled the App Store in, in later years. I mean, Steve really did want to do right by people, and wanted to maintain that. But anyway, so I'm babbling here totally incoherently. There came a time when Steve came into the room and said, you know who'd be great in this campaign? Nelson Mandela. He goes, I really, really respect Nelson Mandela, and I think he would be unbelievable. If we could get him, that would just be like killer. So we said, well, we'll look into it. Although he's currently the president of South Africa, it might be a little difficult. Um, he's likely to say no, but sure, we'll ask. So. We sent out word to someone, I don't know who actually handles these things, I certainly didn't do it, but we got a report very quickly, like, no thanks from Nelson Mandela, I'm president of a country. And, um, <laughs> and maybe when I'm out of office, like six months, I would consider it. And he was at that time scheduled to be retiring. I, I should have said that at the beginning. He was on his way out, but he wouldn't be out of office for another three months. And then he said, should wait. So Steve said, well, how about if I call Bill Clinton up and ask him to help us? <laughs> Bill Clinton, who so, was the president And he was the, the sitting president of the U.S. And I thought, hmm, all right, well, you know, if that doesn't work, we can always go to the United Nations or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, so I really thought nothing more of it. And then it's one of those moments you remember the time and place once again. But I was, it was a Sunday afternoon, I was at home, and I needed to get some copy approved for an ad we were running. So I was on the phone with Steve, and the phone rang. His other phone rang. Hold on a second. He comes back on. He goes, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. So I said, fine. And literally, to the, almost to the minute, 10 minutes later, my phone rings again. And he goes, uh, hey, you know who that was? And <laughs> I'm like, OK, tell me. You know, it seemed like he wanted me to ask, obviously. He goes, uh, that's Bill Clinton. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. How's Bill? Um, he said, yeah, he talked to the Mandela people, and they said uh, he doesn't really want to do that. It's um, kind of you know, not really a, a, the right thing to do. <laughs> so uh, I thought, well, you tried. Thank you. And uh, it always fascinated me that the president of the United States would actually spend his time recruiting a fellow head of state to appear in an ad campaign. <laughs> But that's the kind of persuasive power that Steve had, you know. So um, yeah. I think, as people know, Richard Dreyfuss did the, the voiceover for the Think Different yes. campaign. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, um, and Steve recorded it. I think that's on YouTube, I believe. Yes. Um, and is great, although unused. One of my favorite factoids from the book is the fact that Phyllis Diller was also brought in to possibly do that voiceover. Did I put that in the book, or was that just in my blog? That's I in the book. Oh, really? Hmm. I have to read it sometime. <laughs> um, yeah, it's actually a really fascinating story, at least I think so. Um, well, first of all, just to go back one uh, bit there, I was actually the person who uh, went up to Apple and recorded Steve doing that voiceover, which we, um, you know, we took a sound guy from the agency and went up there with a digital tape recorder, and Steve thought it was a bad idea from the start, but he agreed to meet us, and he said, I'll do... Um, Actually, I'm getting the story backwards. I'll meet you in the Apple Auditorium, which he did. And then uh, he was in a grumpy mood that day. Things were really busy. I don't know what was going on in his life. But he just walked in. And he goes, listen, I'm really busy. I'm doing one take, and I'm out of here. And I don't think this is a good idea anyway. So I was like, all right, well, that chirpy attitude. We'll see what we can get out of you. 
And uh, we recorded them. He actually did three takes, and that was um, nice of him to do. And then he said, I'm out of here, and he left. And uh, we actually tried to sell that as the voice. We, we thought that Steve was the one. He loved the, the, the commercial. He loved the words, and he thought they just so perfectly cap- captured Apple's spirit. Um, our point was, well, if you really believe that, Steve, then you should read it because no one is going to be more convincing. An actor is going to act as best he can, but you really believe it. So um, we recorded that, and then uh, we recorded the other celebrities, and the night we had to make the decision, Steve uh, said, it's not even close. I don't like my voice. I don't want to be a distraction. People are going to be talking about whether I should have done this or, or not, and the words are important. I want people to just hear the words. Therefore whoa, Um, therefore I don't want to do it. Uh, So we went with Richard Dreyfuss. However, about a week before that, um, we were in one of those meetings and Steve said, he'd bring these things up sometimes, and he said, I've got an idea for you for the voice for the commercial. At that time we were just doing, we had the visuals together and we were finessing the script, et cetera, and he said, I got an idea, it's gonna sound a little crazy, but it's Phyllis Diller. And we all looked at each other like, yeah, it does sound crazy. (laughs) Um, And he said, but hear me out on this one. He goes, she's just, we're working with her at Pixar on A Bug's Life. And she plays the queen ant, and she is just like really good. She's got a really interesting voice. And I'm not saying you should definitely use her, but you should definitely check her out. So uh, I'll try to make this story shorter because I can go on with this one, but we... (laughs) First of all, I had no idea how old she was at the time. She shows up at the studio, um, you know, can't walk very well, and she has her assistant with her because she's got to, you know, help her get from place to place. I think her sister, her assistant was as old as she was. So you, so you got like two 90-year-old women trying to help each other walk across the room. But I gave her the script and said, yeah, this is what we're doing. And she read it. Uh, I came back in a few minutes, and she was like really impressed. She said, this is, just, this is beautiful, this is poetry, uh, this is just brilliant, and I, I can't wait to read it. And I'm like, oh, thank you, good, good. And then we, we put her in the studio, we, um, we played her the music, which is, you'll recall for that commercial was very, um, not somber, but it was violins, and it was just really appropriate for it, but it was, and, she, and again, she was taken to new heights. She thought, this is just fantastic, the idea of being part of this, this is just so good. Um, so we all go back in the sound room. She's in, behind, in the booth there, and the engineer starts up the music, and we've got the visuals going for her there and everything. And you know, it starts, here's to the crazy ones, right? The misfits, the rebels. So, I, I, okay, sound men, prepare to turn the sound down. But she just, out of the blue, just like, here's to the crazy ones! And she just like <laughs> screamed it in her worst possible Phyllis Diller voice. <laughs> so, and, and you know, my... Uh, Colleagues and myself were like, holy cow, you know. Um, and I have to say, um, I don't like to brag, but uh, one of my particular talents is working with voiceovers. I'm pretty good at, at describing to them what they should do without saying, could you just read it like this, you know, that kind of thing. So in my best po- with my best possible manners, I said, nice read, Phyllis. <laughs> uh, but, you know, maybe try a little a little quieter read, you know, just maybe a little more introspective, you know. Oh, I know exactly what you mean, I know what you mean. Oh yeah, fine, fine, I'll do that. So we all assume the positions again, the music starts, and it was, here's to the crazy ones! <laughs> and she's like, oh my God. Um, so then we're like, well, now what do we do with her? You know, it's like, well, let's get one more out of her. So I did it again, I said, we're getting closer. <laughs> but uh, really, like, you know, just a wild idea. Why don't we try one that's like more of a whisper even? You know, just like really because the music is so moving and all that. And uh, so she goes, oh, goes, well, she goes, I don't really do that. I'm like, well, I know, but you know, you have such an interesting voice. Maybe if you just whispered it more. So she goes, all right, I'll give that a try. And then the thing starts again, and I, I won't yell it one more time, but she did the exact same thing. I mean, it was <laughs> the identical read three times in a row, no matter how much I implored her. And that tape, along with the Steve Jobs tape, um, was filed away somewhere, and I never saw it again. So we're talking, was it 97, 12 years ago or so. Um, when I saw that the Steve one had been 
released uh, and put up on YouTube, which the, uh, the date on that YouTube video was like two years before Steve died. I was like, whoa, how come I never saw that before? But the Phyllis Diller one is still locked away in a vault somewhere. Um, I would pay money. In fact, here, I think you guys would too, so maybe we could sort of make a little collection. Um, it would be really fascinating to hear. I hope it lives up. When it does finally come out, I hope it lives up to my, to my telling because uh, that's my memory of it. But my memory is a bit faulty at times. Hello. <laughs> I want to hear it, Tom. Um, so, um, so the iMac, I think that is something where we can yes. pay tribute to you individually for, oh. name, for naming this product. That, that was your idea. Indeed. I, you may blame me for that. There are times when I feel very guilty about it because I know people are sick and tired of it. When the iPad came out, honestly, I didn't know which way that was going to go. Um, I remember blogging about it once, like, you know, I hear all these rumors about it's going to be called Slate or something like that. And I said, you know, this is actually a turning point for the I because if this is an I word, then it's going to be an I thing forever because there's no turning back. But if they name it something else, then maybe we're on to something new. And, uh, uh, and it was an I thing. Actually, the opening day of the I Apple Store, the Cube on Fifth Avenue, um, I was in there, I was doing a documentary for Apple at the time on the making of that store, and Steve was there that day. And I had that conversation with him then. We were standing over the the um, IMAX in the store, and, and at that point, not a single human being, a uh, customer, had set foot in the store yet. Um, it was just immaculate. And I don't know how it even came up, but we were talking about the name IMAC, and um, said, well, obviously, it's not totally logical, because you've got MacBook and MacBook Pro. There should be a Mac and a Mac Pro. But this is Steve talking. Um, he said, but we can't call it a Mac because they're all Macs. Like when someone comes in the store and says, my friend told me I should get a Mac, it would be, well, do you mean the Mac or do you mean some other Mac? So it wouldn't work very well. So they're kind of stuck with the iMac as well. So the i is probably, uh, will probably be part of our lives forever. But the story you may be getting at was the, the naming, the original? Or the, well, yes, the, that was not the, the first name that Steve liked. Right. He liked his own idea. Right. Well, this one, maybe you've heard about it because it's gotten some press, but... I will tell it again, but Steve, that day he said, we've got two weeks to name this product. Um, we had, we'd had our briefing on it, we'd seen it, and um, he said, I've got a name I really like, but maybe you guys can do better, and the name I like is Mac Man. Um, and we, <laughs> please control yourself. <laughs> People, you know, we had the same reaction, to be honest. It was like, you kidding? Mac Man? Um, and then when he told us what his goals were, it made even less sense because he said, the thing's got a handle on it, but it weighs, uh, you know, it weighs like 50 pounds. It's not portable. So when you think about names, don't give it a name that sort of pushes it in the direction of portable. Um, so we're thinking, well, you know, uh, Walkman. That's the first thing you think about with MacMan. So Walkman is the world's most portable product. So why do you like MacMan? And then he said... Also, because it looks not goofy, but it looks a little cartoony. It looks unlike any computer that's ever been made, this bulbous thing. It looks Jetsons-ish. I don't want people to think it's a game or a toy. So try to avoid pushing it in that direction. And we're thinking, well, Mac-Man sounds like Pac-Man. So how much closer can you get? <laughs> so his reasoning didn't make any sense at all. And I tell the story because it's funny, and it's just hard to imagine Steve being so utterly wrong. Um, but it was one of his few lapses. Obviously, the man was a total genius, and we'll never, you know, we won't see the likes of him for many, many decades to come. Uh, but the funny thing about the way people work, I mean, you can be really, really smart, um, but when you feel in your gut that something is good, it doesn't matter how many facts people throw out. You know, it's, it sounds like a game, it sounds portable, you said you don't want it to do those things, it's a horrible name. And he would say, like, well, I still like it, you know. Um, so see if you can do any better. So we came back with uh, about five names the next time, and I you know, had to go through that. Do I start with a good name, or do I build up to it, or whatever? And I decided I would build up to it. So the first four names, uh, and I, I, I should quit while I'm ahead with the iMac thing. If I tell you the other names, you're going to lose all respect for me. But, uh, but other people probably came up with those names. Um, but anyway, there was like Rocket Mac and Maxter, and um, every Mac was my least favorite. 
uh, because it was the Mac for everyone. It's like, how pathetic can you get? But, but that was just the, the build-up, the fodder we were throwing out there because here's Steve, we got this name, and, and I had, we had a board for every name, and it said iMac, I for, uh, I meaning me, for individual imagination, all the I things you could put to it. Um, and by the way, it's kind of a good foundational thing, just in case one day we might ever want to name another product, you've got an I thing. Um, and keep in mind that that was a ridiculous thought in those days because Apple made only computers. There was no concept there would be music players and phones and tablets and things like that. So that was kind of a far off ridiculous thought. We just needed a name for the computer. Well, so Steve looked at the first four names. It was hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. And then it was like a little fanfare for iMac. I'm like, oh, hate it. So, so like now you guys got a week left and we got to do it in a week. So we went back to the agency. Uh, threw out more ideas, came back with a few more, and he didn't like any of those either. But then, you know, a wise man once told me that as long as you show him some new things, you can show him the old one too. You can bring it back. If you came back and just said, we're sticking with this one, you'd get nowhere. So we showed him the new ones, then brought out iMac again, and he goes, hmm. He goes, well, I don't hate it this week, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, still, don't love, but I still don't like it. I don't, I don't hate it, but I don't like it. That's basically what he said. Um, and now you've got two days to crack it, because we're still going with Mac Man if you can't come up with anything better. Um, and um, I really, really wish there was an ending to this story, <laughs> but in fact, there is none. The next day, I was talking to someone inside Apple, and they said, hey, did you hear Steve has uh, got the name silkscreened on a model, and he's showing it around to people, and you're getting a lot of good reactions. I'm like, oh. That's interesting. Last I heard, he didn't like it. <laughs> so um, then another day or two later, like that's the name. That's what we're going with. So uh, I think, you know, again, I don't think there's a, in many ways, it was an obvious name. I for internet, Mac for obvious Macintosh. Um, so in retrospect, it certainly looks simple. So I don't need to be... Um, uh, praised for such a thing, but I think the thing that you, you all owe me for is that if it weren't for that bit of perseverance, then you'd be sitting there with your phone man and your pod man. And you were, we were talking about that earlier, about what would have happened if it wasn't I. Yeah, right? that there's some alternate universe where who knows right. what happened. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, Obviously, nobody can know, but um, I, I suspect that if it was Mac Man, um, we would, that would have been the name of that computer, and we would have moved on for other products. So I think the fact that iMac had a foundational aspect to it, um, and it became, you know, it evolved over the, over the years, obviously. It sort of stands for consumer product from Apple now. So one of the things that makes the book fun is you don't just talk about all these instances where Steve Jobs was right. You talk about stories like Mac Man and him wanting to put a golden ticket inside an iMac box and Greek the winner dressed as Willy Wonka and all these other crazy ideas which he did get talked out of. And for someone who was so unimaginably stubborn, he did seem to have a capacity to be talked out of stuff, to accept better ideas when they came along. Can you talk a little bit about right. that? Um, yes. I think, I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about Steve as much as it should is that um, he was not the all-controlling tyrant. He, in fact, he purposefully surrounded himself with the smartest people he could find. I hope that one doesn't say, get this guy off the stage quick. <laughs> um, he, he knew that he didn't personally have the talent to do these things. He had the vision, he had the ability to lead groups, but he needed great people around him. So he wasn't going to just fill rooms with these people and say, do it my way. He wanted people to be creative. And I think one of the great things that I experienced personally working with people inside Apple was that there was a, when, we, when it was time to go to Steve and show him things, people wanted to show him more than he expected. There was a, a joy and like, oh, he'll never see this one coming. I think he's going to love this. Whereas at other companies, if you tried something like that, when I'm working at, uh, with Intel or Dell, and I have a feeling because I'm in, uh, some of this might be enemy territory, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> anybody from, I should ask, people work at Intel here, anybody? 
No? Oh, there's one. Hi. <laughs> well, take this with a grain of salt. I'm only talking about the marketing group. I, I think Intel is like one of the most brilliant companies in the world. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, he works in marketing, too? <laughs> Oops. Um, anyway, I, I think in those places, you, you tend to get slapped down for, you know, if the CEO is expecting to see something, we already told them that you're not going to go back and say, well, we had this different idea because people around the world have bought off on it and you can't disrupt the process like that. So I think at, uh, at Apple, there, was, uh, there still is, I hope, um, this desire to always be creative and, and do things that may not be expected. Here's a question from the audience which you probably cannot answer, but it, it might lead to some interesting conversation. And that question is, why did Steve select an apple for the logo of the company when pears and plums are more common in Santa Clara County? <laughs> um, but that, does, that raises something which is fascinating, which is the degree to which the, the, the things that Apple is still using for branding date back to 1976 and 1977 when you know, Steve was 21 and the, the company was him and was. Um, but they created a brand which actually is very consistent with Apple in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, they, there was that ad for, I think, the Apple II, which you mentioned in the book, with, with the tagline, simplicity yeah. is the ultimate sophistication. Right. Was that just a, a little miracle, or how, how did that happen? Um, well, I think that's the great thing about Apple, I think, and that's a direct result of Steve running the company, is that he really understood the power of a brand. He really was one of the great marketing people of our day and age, and these other companies tend to, you know, try to create great products and throw them out there and see if they sell and, and improve them and improve them, but Steve did have a, a, a much bigger vision marketing-wise than that. He understood the power of a brand. I talked in the book a little bit about the brand bank. He really believed, I got this lecture a couple of times, that every good thing you do you, is a deposit to your brand bank. And uh, In fact, he used Intel, I'm sorry to say, um, as, a, as an example, um, when there was a problem with the, I think it was the Pentium processor that wasn't doing math correctly, or um, mm -hmm. I forget which one it was, but. There was quite a bit, uh, and he said, you know, I, that's actually when I was going off to work um, on Intel, uh, the, that problem with the chip had happened in the past, but when I was having one of my farewell chats with Steve, he said, he was giving me his advice, and he said, you know, um, actually, it's kind of a funny thing, it's coming back to me now, he said, how much are they spending on advertising every year, and at that time, I didn't really know, so I said, I don't know, a couple hundred million dollars, who, who, who knows? He goes, you know what, I think they could stop spending, um, they could cut their, their budget to zero tomorrow and it wouldn't make a bit of a difference. Um, I was like, hmm, okay, I'll be sure to tell them. <laughs> and, uh, but he went on to talk about the Intel brand. He said, you know, that the Intel brand is one millimeter thick. And because they've never invested in it, when something bad happens, and he used that little math problem as his example, he said, you know, like the sharks come out and everyone is just attacking the company. He said, if you build up this balance in your brand bank, um, you're resistant to such things. You, he said, you never know what, what unpredictable problem will rear its head, what scandal may, you know, may pop up. Stuff like antenna gate. Exactly. And, and that's a very, very good point. Um, Apple could live through that. People did attack them for actually for different reasons now because Apple is so successful. There's this whole group of people who can't wait to find the reason to bring them down. But, um, but they're able to withstand that because uh, when they make a mistake like that, it, it would kill a lot of companies or be a serious, serious problem. So he gets up there and says what he says, and a couple weeks later it's forgotten, kind of. And I think it's because Apple has this balance in the brand bank. So I think the app, you know, the apple sort of rep represented purity and simplicity from the get-go, yeah. uh, in a way that a plum or a pear would not have. Well, you know, the apple thing. You know, I, actually, I knew the guy. I haven't seen him in many, many years. But the guy who created the rainbow logo, and they finally moved away from whatever monstrosity existed before that. I forget that or Yeah, thing. Isaac Newton. Right. Uh, and it's funny too. I don't know. I get a kick out of these things because I'm in advertising, and and you know, for most of it, it's just a bunch of guys sitting around in a room. Um, 
men and women. I didn't mean to be so sexist. Um, but you know, it's like, hey, that's cool. Let's do this or that. So I can see what it was like you know, when that first Newton with the apple falling on his head or whatever that was logo, <laughs> it was really ornate, like it took, uh, yeah. it was like a, yeah. Um, and I can see them saying like, wow, name the company's Apple, Newton, that works so great. But you look at it today and it's just very naive that something like that, something that complicated, thank you, Steve, could, uh, could become symbolic of the company. So there's this interesting clip um, that Regis McKenna made available to the museum we were discussing earlier. Um, Steve actually addresses the name of the company, uh, and he talks about the name Apple, and uh, I guess you didn't know that, right? Um, that it symbolized simplicity and sophistication, and that's why he, chose, that's why he liked the, the name Apple. And, uh, and that he then went on to say that that was the line on the cover of the Apple II brochure, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And that struck me, too, because when I saw uh, that brochure, you could literally put those lines, just like the think different words, you could put simplicity as the ultimate sophistication on every product Apple has ever made. And so Apple has been consistent doing these things from day one because they had a leader who enforced this vision and kept everyone thinking about what was really important and, and where the company was supposed to go. And I think that's what most technology companies lack. They change from year to year uh, you, you can't put like a single product on a, on a page and say, this is Google or something like that. You, it's, it's just harder for everyone else. And Apple is almost an unfair advantage because their brand is innovation. So everything they do is an ad for the brand as well as the product. And most companies advertise their products and hopefully they reflect the brand, but they're not so directly linked as Apple uh, as Apple's brand is just so, so perfectly linked to the products uh, that they get all this, you know, one reinforces the other and you end up being the most valuable company on earth. You talk about the, the iPod silhouette ads mm -hmm. as sort of the moment when the product ad and the brand ad for Apple became one and the same. Did you work on those? I did not, no, I didn't work on iPod. In fact, I bought a brand new MP3 player a week before the iPod came out. <laughs> <clears throat> And sold it immediately, I should add, because it held all of two CDs. Um, yeah, so what's the question then? The, it's, the silhouette ads were, were branding, and they also yeah. were designed to move iPods out of stores. Yeah, I think every, every Apple product ad has been a brand ad. Um, with iPad, I guess it was about last year, they actually did a couple of ads that were more brand ads than iPad 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 ads, I believe, but they were still iPad ads. Um, but they were a little bit more brandy than anything I'd seen before, which I thought was interesting because one could debate whether or not they need to do that anymore, but um, that's Apple's brand. When you see some super cool thing that works by touch and you just want it from, from first look, that's, that's Apple's brand. That's what they, you know, so it's just one more reason to believe that anything Apple ever comes out with, you're going to want. So I don't know any other company that's done that, that's built their brand over such a period of time. And, and all over the world, all of my friends in advertising tell me that their clients are like, let's do something like Apple would do. And you, know, you might get one brief moment, but it's not going to build in the long term what Apple has done. It's just, it's hard to duplicate because it takes a really long time to do it. You have a couple of good stories in the book about Dell and Intel, both of who, who you've worked with, where they decide to do big campaigns to show the world what their brands stand for, and then they kind of realize, wait, wait a minute, what, what, is, what does our brand stand for again? And if, right. if a brand, if you don't have that, what Apple had, which was a brand that's been consistent for 35 years, can, right. can you build a brand right. that, that stands for something after you're already a large company? Well, that's a good point. Um, Apple did always stand for something, and it was never even a question when we were doing the Think Different campaign. Nobody ever had to say, well, do you have a document that could explain exactly what you'd like to be? It was just obvious what Apple was. And Dell, everything about Dell was um, a bit thinner. You know, it just, it, all the motivations were different. Uh, at Apple, we were never in a meeting 
where it was like, we need to get 10% more clicks this month than last month. Uh, at Dell, that's almost what all of the meetings were about. It was all about making the spreadsheets work, you know. And Steve, Johnny Ive has been very vocal saying that Apple doesn't, uh, doesn't set out to make a profit. They set out to make great products, and if they do that well, profit ensues. And I think that is extremely different than what other companies do. And, and some people probably say that's bull, Apple doesn't do that, they're a big company, whatever. But I think that is true of Apple. I think they do realize, and if they ever stop thinking that way, then I think they're in trouble. But they, their first priority has to be to create products that reflect what it is that they are, a company that innovates. Um, I think I deviated from the answer was the question again. <laughs> um, well, I had another question, which is, okay. uh, is there technology advertising, either in the present or past, which you admire um, mm. and, and feel like did the job well? Uh, Pregnant pause. Yeah, there. actually, no. I, I was going to say, most uh, creative people in advertising that I know are you know, love to attack other people, but uh, can't come up with answers to questions like that. Only every every... I'm very picky, so every two or three years someone does something that I wish I did. It was just you know, really, really great. Um, and it's Apple, of course, but the Mac versus PC stuff I really, really liked. Um, and we can get back into that in a little bit about the new ads, I guess. Um, uh, but uh, Google had a moment when they did the, um, the search ads, and I'm not sure if they still do them even, but where they tell a story through search. Yeah. Um, and they, they put them on, it might have been on the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Um, very simple that you could tell a human story just by search fields and the images that come up and, and the photos you share and that kind of thing to show how Google is a part of a human being's life and then can really make life you know, more interesting and fulfilling. I thought that, that campaign Google was Plus good. and so forth. Yeah, but I don't, you know, I, I, I don't enjoy, well, I enjoy criticizing, <laughs> but the uh, Android, a lot of Android stuff and, you know, things that Samsung does, you know, making fun of Apple and making like Apple's big brother now, how ironic, you know, they used to be 1984, the revolutionaries, and now they're a big brother and trying to twist things and I enjoy all the, the tricks these companies employ to try to make a dent in what Apple has built, but uh, I haven't seen anybody succeed yet. Speaking of 1984, um, that's pretty consistently named as the best single commercial of all time. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as you mentioned when we were talking, you know, it did not result in a lot of people buying Macs at first. The Mac got off to a slow start. You also talk about the switcher ads from about 10 years ago showing real people explaining why they dumped windows. Mm -hmm. Got a huge amount of attention. They did not at the time result in a lot of people switching. Switching kind of happened later after the iPhone and iPad came along. Um, can an ad be successful if everybody loves it and pays attention to it, but it does not actually move devices? So one of the great things about being a in and around the world of Apple is that it is so incredibly analyzed and overanalyzed that things, you, you, people try to be smart by pointing things out that are contrary to popular belief. So I read something, and actually I'm sorry to say it came from Regis McKenna, um, but I think he was misinterpreted. Uh, if I recall, I think I pointed out in something I wrote, but the, the headline of the story was that 1984 wasn't so great after all, it didn't do anything. It's like, well, can we, hold on a minute there, because 1984, you know, was the beginning of, of just an incredible uh, era for, for Apple, and even if it didn't result in sales at the beginning, it, it spurred the company on for so many years, and it was the spirit of the company. Still today, they talk about it, so to say that it, well, it failed because it didn't have, you know, it didn't create so many sales, I think is just pretty absurd. I think Apple's gotten hun hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of goodness out of that ad. The switcher ads, um, maybe not so much, in that they're, they're kind of fun, and they were a moment in time, but I think one day when they opened the Museum of Apple, is that a wing here or anything? <laughs> um, I think the switchers campaign will be an interesting exhibit, but it won't attract a lot of viewers. I think it's just kind of, oh, they did that and that was cool, whatever, but it, it wasn't like a landmark thing like, um, 
like uh, 1984 was. And actually, there's a, a, a thread that runs through many years, which is interesting. It goes all the way back to uh, the John Scully days. But Apple has tried many times to put a dent in what they considered this, this monstrous thing that they couldn't put a dent in, which was Windows. Um, so they tried a lot of things. We did things in the John Scully days that were um, the easy way and the hard way and all these logical arguments we tried to make. And then the switchers at the time was thought to be the, oh, we finally cracked it. Because it's hard to say, well, in any ad, it's hard to say buy us instead of the other guy because there is arrogance built into that. That's part of the art of advertising is to be able to say you're superior without being really annoying and um, elitist, all the things that Apple is often accused of. But you, it, it is hard to say we're better than the other guy without being that. So for many years, Apple struggled to sort of crack the whole Windows thing. And I think they were seen to be, well, the ads didn't work, and people dismissed them as being arrogant. And that's how this whole you know, arrogant thing started. Um, but the switcher campaign seemed genuine, and it didn't seem as arrogant, and a lot of people thought like, hey, they finally cracked it, but they didn't. And then months later, you'd see like, well, sales are still kind of down. <laughs> um, so personally, I thought when the Mac versus PC campaign out, came out, I thought now they finally cracked it because, again, there's got to be some arrogance built into it because we're saying we're better, but they made the PC character kind of lovable. In fact, I read a lot of articles. They thought he was the most adorable character in, in the thing. I mean, and now that this new controversy has come up, um, I see people talking, because I made the point that Mac PC was so brilliant and it ran for four years, 66 commercials and all that. And I'm hearing people say like, well, that campaign was a failure and it pissed people off mm -hmm. and this and that. I'm like, what? I thought it was pretty darn good myself. And Apple certainly wouldn't have run it all those years if it wasn't doing a lot of good for them. Um, but I think, again, it, it's hard to craft that perfect message that's the right amount of confrontation and a degree of respect so you don't seem mean. That's the, the main thing. So they put down the PC, but they didn't seem mean about it. Um, and I think they really hit that magic combination in that spot. So speaking of, um, of times um, when things weren't immediately successful, you, you actually started with Steve at Next and were, were there throughout the next adventure before he came back. And uh, that was spectacular technology and every single Apple device today is like a great grandchild of the next. But the company, as a standalone yeah. company, was not a success. Can you, can you talk a little bit about any lessons, um, if any, to be, to be drawn from that? Well, I think Steve tried to do something very different with Next, and it was a business-to-business -business proposition. He dealt with enterprise infrastructure, and he would make these major sales to corporations that had 100 offices around the world and that kind of thing. And it was a very different thing. It's a very different thing to sell systems like that versus like, hey, here's an iPod. So that magic thing was missing. And I, thought, I think Steve felt like he, um, he had something really, really good and it was going to change the course of computing. And it did in certain ways. Um, and I think the way it worked out is actually fabulous that what he worked on at Next became a part of Apple, and, and he himself matured in different ways that he might not have had he remained at Apple. So um, in the end, you can look back and say that's pretty neat the way it worked out, but, but Next was a bit of a struggle. And uh, we have an eyewitness right here, actually, the, the fabulous Bambi here who worked at Next um, and was, 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 lived on Steve Street when he was growing up. Um, and she was actually the brains behind the whole outfit. Steve took orders from Bambi. <laughs> uh, another question from the audience, which I'm sure people are wondering about, which is, what, if any, was Apple's response to your book? And did, uh, did you give it to them before you published it? I actually thought long and hard about that one, because I didn't know um, how they'd feel about it. Um, to be honest, I intended to tell Steve about it. Uh, and this all started. Uh, you know, like three years ago now. So I intended to tell Steve about it, and I was going to ask him if he would write a forward for me. And then while I was sort of mulling all it over and time was going on, um, it, it, uh, suddenly there's an announcement, you know, the Isaacson book was announced. And I'm like, hmm, I don't think he's going to want to write a forward for me. Um, he probably doesn't want another book coming out that's, you know, whatever. So I, I just thought, well, I'll think about it. And I thought about sharing it with 
uh, but if you don't, if you tell them what you're going to do, and then they'll want a, the right of approval and the whole bit. So um, I decided it was probably best to just do it. And then you know, Steve's medical condition changed dramatically, and and he couldn't be bothered with something like this. So um, I, I, from the people I've spoken to inside Apple, everything's just fine. I mean, the book is a tribute to Apple. I think Apple is just like the most amazing company. I've, if you haven't figured that out by now, I have just incredible respect for everyone I've ever met there. And I think they've accomplished such amazing things that that's why I wrote the book. I think the principle that drives it, this love of simplicity, is a lot more present than people give it credit. And I think Steve applied that just because that was a part of his personality, he applied it to everything, not just the products, but the processes, the development, the advertising, the naming. I mean, it was just always a consideration, like what, what are, what's gonna make sense to people and uh, what are they gonna get quickly and, and appreciate better? And did you get any feedback from them since the book came out, for good or bad? Uh, nothing direct, no death threats or anything. I haven't revealed anything. <laughs> Confidential, I don't think. Other questions from the words. audience. Um, did Steve Jobs' style hinder, with an underline under it, innovation and creativity? And I, I imagine that kind of refers to his reputation as a micromanager yeah. who wanted things done his way. Uh, and from the outside, there are certainly people who say that must have been really stifling. Well, first of all, I have to acknowledge the limits of my own knowledge. I was not involved in product development, so I was seeing things from the marketing side, and we'd get invited in various times to give an opinion on the colors of iMac or something like that. So I can't really say on the product development side if he were stifling or not, but I, my gut tells me no. He drove people to do great things, and he would, he would encourage greatness, and he would reject things when they weren't great enough. So I don't think he was stifling anyone. I do think there are a lot of people who probably don't like to work in that kind of environment, and they may feel like, I, I don't like that kind of pressure, but those people don't succeed at Apple. So You have a great okay. line in the book. You say that he was not a creative genius. He was a genius who loved creativity. Um, which sounds like he was somebody who appreciated good ideas from anywhere. Yeah, as I said before, he liked to, he would often talk about his goal of hiring the smartest people. He wanted great creative people around him. And he certainly wanted to, um, he wanted them to spread their wings, but someone had to corral it all and say, this is where we're going and that's a great idea, but it's not gonna work because this one's better, so sorry. And you know, there. There are all kinds of ways that that worked, but I think um, it's all about hiring the best. And, and that's what he did. I think he just uh, has a, an incredible talent for hiring and, and, of course, managing. Another question which you may or may not feel like you have insight on, and that is, was Steve Jobs happy and satisfied with his own life? Was he, at the end, a content person? Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, couldn't really answer that question. No, I mean, I, to be honest, I didn't have contact with him the last couple of years. Um, I'm assuming that he did what he did. He was very fulfilled, I know, when, he, when a product like iPhone came out or a product like iPad, and you could see that on his face at the presentation. So he lived for those moments, and, and I do think, I, I actually pointed out in the book that the, um, w one of the lines he contributed in the Crazy Ones commercial was that they push the human race forward. And I think Steve felt compelled to do that. And it wasn't about, here's a cool music player and here's a cool tablet. There was a much bigger vision at work and these were all steps along the way. And I think, I do think, just because you've heard him speak so proudly, that when he saw preschool kids using a tablet or doctors, uh, you know, moms, you know, people in old folks' homes, I mean, every kind of person who didn't really even use computers before, and then all the people who did use computers before using them in different ways at patients' bedsides and whatever. Um, that I know, just again, not by personal contact, but I could see it in his face. <laughs> he loved having that kind of impact on the world. So why don't we start to talk about, about the present day and maybe even the future of, 
the kind of simplicity you write about in the book. Um, Apple released a new ad campaign for the Olympics, which you blogged about and you were not a fan of, and that's gotten quite a bit of attention just over the last day or two. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, we should take a poll here before we start. Have but, you seen uh, the, the new ads with the yeah. doing yes, helping out people in real, um, world, who, real world situations? Yeah. Who likes the new campaign? Do we have some likes? Because there's a lot of opinions in the world. Dislikes? Any? Well, it's actually not as. Who hasn't seen these huh. ads yet? Oh, well, that explains that. Well, <clears throat> this is actually a, a terrible moment for me because, again, I'm a huge Apple fan, and sometimes when I blog in one thing or another, I, I'm accused of being a fanboy or whatever, and I proudly say I am a fan. I really think the company does great things. But I also try to be a little objective um, because advertising is kind of what I do. So in the past, I've sort of complained about a couple of things that I thought might use improvement. Um, but still, in the scope of things, Apple has always just been way above everyone else. So I was just shocked with this campaign that started on the Olympics. Um, I, I, it's just, you know, I, you could read on my blog the specifics, but um, in general, it just doesn't feel up to Apple standards. And that is not a good thing. And there are all these debates going on. I heard from a lot of people who thought it was really good, and they, they give all their reasons. And, uh, I have to make it, uh, I have to differentiate the strategy from the execution because I, I don't have a problem with saying let's do a thing about the genius bar and how people who, in the Apple world, you're not alone. You can go to any Apple store and you can figure something out and, and you can't do that. Well, maybe you can do it at the Microsoft store, I don't know. But I can't imagine it's quite the level of, because they don't make all the computers that they can't really help you as the genius bar can. So. Um, I don't have any problem with the concept, but the execution, when you, when you present something as sort of a sitcom and you've got these exaggerated characters and there's some frantic dialogue, you gotta help me, you gotta help me, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's like, oh, the genius, you know, you can help. And he's sort of like a Seinfeld-esque, uh, Matthew Broderick kind of character. It just feels like you're watching a little bit of a sitcom and not a particularly good one, which is the unfortunate part. I think the writing is not very great. And, so it just feels uh, like a Best Buy commercial, which is a harsh thing to say, Ooh, but that's what, um, stings. I mean, I, I didn't even come up with that. I've read that, you know. Um, it, it's just so, you know, you just don't expect that from Apple. I've gotten a lot of letters from people saying that my wife and I were watching the Olympics and, and we both turned to each other after that spot and said, that was from Apple? Like, holy cow. Uh, it's just like, What's happened to those guys? And you're getting reactions like that. And again, people are defending it by saying, no, no, it's important that for, to get the new people, we need to tell them that they'll have support and everything. And again, I don't have any problem with that. I think the thing that, that people forget about when they have these debates is that your strategy may be a good strategy, but there are a thousand ways to make a commercial out of that. Um, it could be a stra you know, the genius standing there on a white stage just talking, and you write a really good script for him. I mean, and that's a boring example, but you could, you could create all kinds of ways to do that, but they created this one, and this one just doesn't feel very Apple-like. Um, so I'm personally disappointed in it, um, but then the, the timing is unfortunate because it comes nine months after Steve died. So a lot of people are saying, yep, I told you, Steve goes and the whole thing starts to crumble. People have been saying that starting about, yeah. you know, 24 and, hours after he died, people were looking for evidence. That yeah, and, and it was kind of apart. ridiculous because obviously his vision is laid out for a while. I mean, but John Gruber, who, who has a huge following, um, I saw an article this morning, he had uh, offered up the opinion that the product uh, pipeline is well set for a couple of years, but the advertising is something that, that will happen fairly immediately. So if something bad is going to happen there, you'll see it within a year. And... So they quoted him as saying, like, well, there it is. He was right. Um, I'm not prepared to go quite that far because, again, I have this devotion to Apple. I think everyone has low points, and they, it might have been a much better idea at the beginning and somehow went astray, and, you, you know, you can't control all these things. So I give them a little credit and say they made a little mistake, which is more than a little one, um, and the next time they'll bounce back with something better. 
They may not want to change campaigns because that might make them look you know, like wishy-washy or something, but I would imagine that the next spots, if they continued with, continued with these, would be far higher quality, I hope. You do talk in the book about the fact that for a long time Steve really didn't like ads that showed people because if you show a person, they might like that person or not like that person. And so it would just, there are all these Apple ads that show only the product, although eventually, right. you know, Apple did lots of ads with, with people right. in them eventually. That struck me about this new campaign, too, is that there were times like when we started doing the first iMac ads, um, it became a bit of a formula. Uh, you'd have gorgeous product, and you'd have to put the product out there front and center because it was so unusual. That was the selling point of the product was the way it looked. Um, so you'd put the product, you'd have the clever line and the hopefully good copy, and, and life would be sweet. But then we started getting into um, other areas and where human beings might come in handy, and Steve was of the opinion that, yeah, if we put Harry McCracken there, I mean, obviously most people would want to be like you, but, uh, <laughs> but there might be some Maybe who, who are like whatever, and so... Um, I was going to ask for a call of hands on that one, but no. Um, you know, so it's just a risky thing to do to say, like, you know, you can be like this person. Or, I mean, you're not really saying that, but when you're saying this person is using the product and you're spending all these millions of dollars to put them on TV, you're, you kind of are saying that. This is the kind of person who uses our product. Um, I would actually go back. Um, I'd forgotten about this one already, <laughs> but the first iPod commercial, which I do mention in the book also, all right. which was horrid. By, uh, it was probably worse than the current campaign, come to think of it, because it was one of those examples, and maybe I feel that way you know, more strongly than others, um, because that was an example of a guy I do not want to be like. And for those of you who don't know it, it was a guy sitting at his computer playing on his iTunes. He was like rocking out to this music, and then comes the revolution. He's got a thing called iPod, so he unplugs the thing and then puts on the earphones and he's still listening to the same song. I don't know how they even did that with that technology, but that was the concept of the commercial, I guess. And then he proceeds to dance out, uh, around the living room and out the door and it was like, oh my God, he looks like uh, an idiot. And, and people started referring to the commercial as the iCloud commercial. <laughs> um, but the product was really good. I mean, iPods set the world on fire. So again, a bad ad isn't going to kill you, and you're out there, and your people are still talking about it, and there were probably people who thought it was a good ad, but I think most people were very disappointed by it, and um, I, I wonder, because I, I wasn't involved in that, if Steve wasn't kicking himself because you know, he didn't follow his own rule on that one. He showed someone, you know, it wasn't just a user, it was someone who was really demoing the product, and you know, you could be like that guy if you got an iPod, and he was really the last person in the world I want to be like. Um, so a couple yeah. of bad spots may just be a couple of bad spots, not the beginning of the end of the world. Yeah, I mean, between all of us in this room, promise to not let it go any further. I worry a little bit uh, because of this, you know, Phil Schiller is in charge of advertising now, so I'm told. And uh, there were meetings where Phil didn't like something that we thought was great, and Steve vetoed him. So that is somewhat fresh in my mind, and I look at these spots and go, hmm, all right, maybe it's one of those situations where there was, there was nobody there to veto. Um, but that's all sheer conjecture. Um, so um, hmm. you're thinking, going just beyond the advertising to Apple in general today and moving forward, I mean, it seems like to a, the greatest degree possible, this is a company full of people who, who understand simplicity and some of the concepts you talk about. So it, it's not like anybody there wants to reject the notions right. you talk about that have made Apple so successful, but they, they also don't have Steve there wielding the simple stick. Um, and how important was the fact that there was this guy here who had started the company there vetoing things? Um, and it, it, he leaves a huge hole. Nobody can argue right. about that. But right. to what can Apple... Move forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I truly believe that Steve was just incredibly unique. I was actually taught a long time ago, you're never supposed to use a modifier before the word unique. You're either unique it is what it not. is, right? He but was. he was incredibly unique. Um, and there will never be another one, and you know, certainly not running Apple anyway. So it does make you think, but I also know that Steve 
instilled his values in the company. As you say, everyone buys into it. And they have the Apple University now, which was designed to help the executives maintain those values. And everyone knows that Apple exists to innovate. And then when they stop doing that, they're in big trouble. So all of that's good. Um, but it is what it is. And Walt Disney died, and the company went on and struggled for a while and sort of found its footing again. But they encountered situations that Walt would never have imagined acquiring ABC and things like that, Apple is going to encounter situations that Steve never imagined. And, it, and Steve himself said, don't do the what would Steve do thing, just do what's right based on what we all know and believe. So I think Apple absolutely has uh, a strong set of values and that will guide them, and that they, but they will make mistakes. And uh, I don't like stitched leather on my contacts <laughs> and my iCal or calendar, whatever it is. Which, by the way, since I brought that up, I'm sorry, I just, part of, you know, OS X, I happen to love, you know, I get the new toy, Mountain Lion, and um, I've just never, you know, the whole stitched leather thing, and, and I was so sure that that was a sign that Steve, of his waning influence on the actual products and his, while his health was declining, and I had a conversation with someone inside Apple who was part of the team, and um, they said, well, and I told him that, I said, well, yeah, obviously, because that stitched leather thing is just kind of weird. And uh, he said, well, actually, I hate to tell you, but Steve loved the stitched leather. So and saying, he sent that person back like four or five times to get the, every little stitch exactly right. So I was like, hmm, all right, well, well, I don't like it anyway. So it's like Mac Man, you know? <laughs> like, sorry, logic means nothing to me. Yeah, apparently he loves textures. And I actually got, I mean, uh, running the company entirely, channeling Steve might be dangerous too because he, he, yeah. he was not perfect. Well, what's really interesting, I think, is that Tim Cook, uh, who is so incredibly capable, but he's not a creative, visionary kind of person. He's more of the nuts and bolts kind of guy, but fortunately we have Johnny Ive. The, the talent is sort of more distributed than it was with Steve. Um, it will be interesting to see how they cope with situations that Steve didn't encounter. You actually, I mean, you had a little bit of experience with the John Scully era, mm -hmm. which was the first time that Apple tried to be Apple without Steve Jobs. And it, from the book, it sounds like it was not a terribly satisfying experience. Yeah. I mean, I, it was more like working for another big company, but it was still Apple, and it was still very special, and it was, how, it was my first involvement with Apple. And at that time, I was working for um, the great Steve Hayden, who was a creative director uh, who did the 1984 commercial. And Steve, as I said in my book, is my god of copywriting. He's the guy I always wanted to be like and you know, studied under him. Um, and, and he was the guy who came over from Shiat Day to be the creative director at BBDO when they moved, if you know the names of these agencies, um, when Scully, Scully instantly fired Shiat Day and brought, back, uh, brought in BBDO who was his agency at Pepsi, and uh, then they brought in Steve Hayden. So Steve Hayden brought me in, and I got to do that kind of stuff. But we did do some pretty good campaigns then, one that you know, is fading a little bit just because it's old, but the What's on Your Power Book campaign. Mm -hmm. We had that pride. I mean, everyone was um, really excited to be working on, on Apple. And in fact, uh, in the people Steve Hayden brought in were all the people who used to work at Shia Day on Apple. So there was actually one funny moment, I remember, when we'd been through some bad meetings with, the, with Scully and his people, and um, we were going up there for like the third time to try to crack this one project, and, and we were, uh, like there were like four of us about to get on the plane, go up to Apple. We were in LA, we had to go up to Cupertino, and one of the guys who was sort of seeing us off, who had been working on the stuff with us, said, and tell them it won't do any good to fire us because we'll just follow them to the next agency. <laughs> uh, so we we're all like the same people, but just doing it from, you know, instead of at Shia, they were at BBDO. And What's on Your Power Book was one of those. That was uh, Chris Wall, who became a very big guy at Ogilvy, and Susan Westra, who's still at Ogilvy. Um, really, really a classic, great campaign. You can look at it now, and it still looks pretty darn good. Well, Ken, this has been just tremendous. Uh, everybody, if you haven't read the book, not only can you get the book here, you can get it autographed by Ken, and it really is a great read. Um, there's just, I've read every other book about Apple. I just learned so much from this one. 
And I'd like to thank you, Ken, and okay. ask the audience. Okay.